If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 is uh, where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. We're in our Matthew series this summer, and we are at chapter 22. We will not finish this chapter yet, but uh, we're working towards it. There are hardback black Bibles under every chair. You can open those up to Matthew 22 on page 828. Uh, You can open a phone or a tablet, but Matthew 22 is where we're going to be. And like I just mentioned, eight weeks left in this building, okay? Okay. Eight weeks here, and then on Sunday, August 4th, we're moving to Front Range Christian School. There's a picture of the auditorium that we are moving into at Front Range. Uh, And and so starting August 4th, we'll be there, but we are going to do a preview Sunday over there on July 14th. So we've got eight Sundays here, but there's one Sunday where we're not going to be here. We're going to be over there, 9.30 in the morning, one service as a preview, July 14th, over at Front Range. Um, But but, uh, it may not feel like it today, because we're in the middle of this summer kind of slump for us, but, but our two services during the fall are full are full. And we were on the cusp of needing a third service. We were also, you know, in a lease year. And so the question was, do we add a third service, which listen to me is insane. Okay. Uh, or, and, and sign another lease and stay here, or do we move? And so this is why the members voted to move, uh, to front range is to, um, essentially have room. I mean, I put it there room for your one more. We've been talking about one more for a while, but that room will seat more than 400. This room seats 150, okay? So we will be able to go back to one service and we will have space to grow where you can keep inviting people. And it's a good thing because y'all, you are inviting people. I just need you to know, you are inviting people. Uh, We talk about this every once in a while, but you know, (laughs) did you know that we don't really promote this church? We're not, we're not like a big kind of promotion church. Uh, that, like our signage, like that big wooden sign is out there for four hours a week. That's our sign game. Our sign game is pathetic, okay? Four hours a week, you might see that sign, but, but we also don't send mailers. Like you ever get mailers in your mailbox from a church that's by you? Uh, we've never mailed anything. I've never mailed anything in almost 10 years of ministry at this church. We don't mail things, okay? It saves on postage and it saves irritating people throwing those things in the trash, right? Uh, we, we don't do that. We don't do like door hangers going door to door, hanging things on doors. Uh, we've never done a Google ad. We've never done a Facebook ad. And I'm not saying anything of those, any of those things are bad in and of themselves, but we don't need to do those things because you invite people here. You all are the inviters. I mean, you invite people at an alarming rate. Alarming. Uh, And uh, I have some numbers for you, okay? This is just helpful. As of last week, uh, we have had 220 first-time guests this calendar year. 220 first-time guests this calendar year, okay? That's more than double that we had the first week of June last year. We had 107 the first, first six months of last year. You've, got, you've done 220. And what's even better is that 199 of those 220 were personal invites. They didn't like Google us churches near me and find us. They, they were invited by you. That's more than 90% of guests are personally invited. So I'm not going to promote this place because I don't need to. Now, again, it's, it's emptier today because it's summer, but like normally, like there's tons of guests and I'm just looking out and I'm like, I don't know you, I don't know you, I don't know you. And, and you're sitting next to somebody who I do know. That's how, I mean, many of you are new within the last couple of years and you would say, somebody I know told me about this. And that's how you got here. So, so, so at the town hall meeting, when we talked about moving to the new space, somebody asked the question, are you, are you afraid of getting too big? And I thought that was a funny question coming from this room, uh, just because of how small it is. But, but I, I kind of gave a snarky little tongue-in-cheek answer, but let me explain what I meant by that. Somebody asked, uh, uh, you know, are, are you afraid of getting too big? And I said, yeah. I mean, yeah, I kind of am. Not like that we have delusions of mega church or something in our future, but, but I, I'm kind of afraid of that because I don't want to lose some of the community that we have and that we love. But that's, hear me, that's why even at this space, we work really hard at getting to know people. 
I hope you feel that when you interact with our staff, but we work hard on remembering names. We work hard on learning stories. We work really hard on trying to get to know people and get people connected at a deeper level here at this church. Um, But then I also said this, and I meant this tongue in cheek, but I also mean this literally. I don't know who to tell to stop coming. Like, I don't know who to tell. Do you know who to tell? Like, which one of you wants to stop inviting people to your church? Because if you want the church to stay the same size, stop it. Stop it because, because we haven't done anything different. Like we haven't done anything different and we're gonna keep doing, in the new space, we're gonna keep doing the same things that we do. We're gonna preach through books of the Bible. Okay, we're gonna worship through word and sacrament, through singing and through the table. We're gonna do that every single week at the new space, okay? We're gonna gather together in our small community groups, our our discipleship groups throughout the week to kind of work this stuff out together. And then we're gonna use our gifts to serve one another and our community. Like we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna keep doing the same thing. And hear me, as your pastor, we're always gonna try and make room for one more. Like we're not, we got no delusions of getting huge, but we're not gonna settle for, sorry, there's no more space here. There's no more room at the inn, right? Like, no, that's, that's not what we're gonna be about. And the reason I'm bringing all this up today is, is not just because in eight weeks we're not going to be in this room anymore, but, but because as we're in Matthew's gospel, I knew that there's one famous part of Matthew chapter 22 that was coming up this week. Uh, and, and I don't know if there are seven verses in the entire New Testament that hold so closely, tightly together all that I hope for and that I pray for us, for Fathom Church, than the seven verses that we're going to study today. I'm not sure there's a better place than this. Uh, The text that we're going to look at is known as the Great Commandment. The Great Commandment is the text that we are looking at today, and it's what I'm hoping for, for us. It's what I'm praying for, for us, okay? All that I hope for us in regards of reaching our neighbors, is found in this text. All that I hope for in in regards to reaching the Southwest kind of side of the metro area is found in this text. All that I am hoping for in regards to even our missions and, and reaching the ends of the earth is found in this text. I don't know if there's seven more comprehensive verses that hold so clearly what I hope for for Fathom Church than this text today. But I just wanna tell you, it's not gonna happen overnight, okay? It's gonna take a lot of time. To actually accomplish what the great commandment tells us is going to take a long, long time. And that's why for for a number of years now, I've been telling you that I hope that I can spend, like I hope the Lord gives me 30 years with, with Fathom Church to do this. I'm not sure he will, but if he does, I would love to do 30 years with you guys trying to do the great commandment together. I used to say 40 years. Okay, when we first planted the church, I said 40 years, but we're almost at 10, okay? And if I said 40 years now, in 40 years, I'll be 80, and like a lot of you will be dead, okay? Um, so I'm gonna just say, I'm gonna hedge my bet and say 30, okay? We'll take 30 years together and see what the Lord does. So that's the setup, okay? Matthew chapter 20, don't worry about it. Some of you won't be dead, okay? <laughs> Matthew chapter 22, uh, we're gonna pick it up where we left off last week in verse 34. So Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Follow along in your text with me. But when the Pharisees, now remember, okay, Pharisees, religious leaders in the temple, conservative religiously, very adherent to the Old Testament laws, okay? So that's the Pharisees, you've met them. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. Now remember the Sadducees. Last week, this is the more progressive edge of the Jewish elite, okay? Remember they came to Jesus asking him a question uh, about marriage in the afterlife. Remember the leveret marriage thing, the one wife and the seven husbands and they all die, everybody dies. Just like I said, okay, everybody dies. Uh, and then in heaven, whose who's wife will she be? And Jesus is like, that's, that's a dumb question. It's a silly, que- silly question. And he shuts them down. So that's what happened last week, okay? The Pharisees hear that the Sadducees had been silenced. When they heard that, they gathered together, verse 35, And one of them, a lawyer, so one of those Pharisees was a lawyer, he asked Jesus a question to test him. Now, pause there. Today is the fourth question 
in Matthew's gospel from the religious authorities in the temple courts to Jesus. The fourth attempt to tempt him, to trap him, to test him as to whether or not, like they're, they're trying to discredit Jesus. It's the fourth time that, that they do this in Matthew's gospel. And it's more of what we saw last week. It was more of this, this uh, they're trying to, They're trying to test him, so we don't really know how genuine their hearts are, but at this point, this Pharisee, who is, uh, he's called a lawyer, that means that he, not like a, you know, a gavel in a courtroom lawyer, this means he's an expert in the Jewish law. He's a Pharisee, he is an expert in the Jewish law, and he's trying to test Jesus, and so he asks him a question. Now look at verse 36, here's his question. Verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, this is a debate that's a hot debate at this time amongst rabbis. So if you are a Jew, if you're specifically a Pharisee, if you're specifically a rabbi in this time, uh, you would believe that all of the laws of the Old Testament are, in fact, very important. They are binding. They are very important. Uh, But there was this ongoing debate as to uh, what they would call which are the heavier laws and which are the lighter laws. Like which laws carry more weight and which laws carry less weight. And so the debate would be, what's the greatest commandment amongst rabbis? So this could actually be a genuine question from this pharisaical lawyer. Hey, Jesus, tell us, teacher, tell us what you think the greatest law is. What's the most important part of the law? Verse 37. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So, Jesus quotes what I had read over us, what Josh read from this mic. Uh, He quotes Deuteronomy chapter six, verses five and six, which is known as the Shema. Okay, in Hebrew, Shema means hear, which is the first word of that text. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. That's the Shema. And if you were a Jew back then, or even today, if you were a Jew, you would know the Shema because it was the central prayer for Jewish lifestyles. So every morning you would recite the Shema and every evening you would recite the Shema and it summed up Jewish faith and practice. You should love God with everything that you are. The whole point is that you should love God with the whole of your being your heart, with your soul, with your mind. Uh, Mark and and Luke add strength to the list. Matthew does not. Uh, Nobody knows why. Nobody knows why. But I don't know that the point is, are there three aspects to loving the Lord your God or are there four aspects? I don't think that's the point. I think the point is every aspect of our life should be focused on that love of God. Every part of you, every nook and cranny of your existence should be about loving God. And some have tried to then break this text down and teach this text by teaching on each aspect, heart, soul, mind, all those, uh, which I think is missing the point at a certain level. I really don't think those things um, are actually mutually exclusive. I think they overlap. They lay on top of one another, uh, demanding that our love for God come from the whole of our personhood, come from who we are in every faculty and every capacity that we have. That's what I think he's getting at. And that's why, church, I hold these verses as kind of the place of my dreams for us. Like the place of my prayers for us is wrapped up there because of that. Those two words on that banner over there. The big ones, not the small ones. Okay, the big ones. Go go deep. For, For almost 10 years, that's what we've been talking about. That as a church, we're about loving God with, with everything, about going deep. So, so we, th- that we would go deep is a part of the great commandment. It's a part of the great commandment. It, th- th- it's about going deep. It's about always seeking to grow in your love for God. 
always seeking to grow in your love for God when it comes to your heart, okay? The things that, 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 that you truly value, uh, it, your soul, like, the things, like the, the things that you really are about, like who you really are deep down in your heart, and then your mind, like the things that you spend time thinking on, considering, and even feeding to yourself. All of those things should be, should be welling up into a love that is deeper and deeper and deeper for who Jesus is. So we could illustrate in a million different ways about these things. We could take each one specifically and illustrate, but, but I want to just do one illustration here. Um, and that's because uh, I think there's one part that seems to me to be uh, concerning, and that is the aspect of our minds. Loving the Lord our God with our minds. So let me illustrate like this. Um, I am personally kind of, I'm really about entertainment and, and media and uh, being entertained. I love to laugh. I love to, uh, like, I love to go to movies. I love to watch shows, like, good shows. I like to read good fiction. I mean, I like to be entertained. I like, uh, I am not an anti-screen guy, okay? Like, I like uh, th- those things. Um, but at some point, modern intake of media and entertainment uh, is destroying some of our capabilities when it comes to thinking. Like thinking and reasoning and really mulling deeply on things. There's a lot of books about how this is affecting our work. We're not able to enter into deep work. It's affecting our relationships. We're not able to do meaningful connection. It's uh, affecting our children, how they are being raised. We are losing a war in our minds because we're just numbing ourselves with a lot of entertainment. And I'm concerned about it. And, and so, so I would just say, if every single day for you is just consumed with, with watching television and, and movies and, and just binging Netflix and YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and just all these things, if that's what you do with all your free time and maybe even cheating a little bit on your work time with your screens. And now, now hear me, I'm not the guy who's like, oh, these screens are the devil, They're demonic. If you look at them too much, you're going to murder someone. I'm not that guy, okay? I mean, I'm not anti-screen. I've got the screens. I've got a screen right now working from a screen, okay? I'm not anti-screens. I'm on the socials. I'm not anti-social media. I look great on them, okay? Me with a filter is awesome. You should follow me, okay? I look awesome on social media. You should do that, okay? But I am telling you that, that I'm concerned that they are a clog for our minds, They can clog us up real quick. Um, And Jesus just said that you need to love God with your mind, with your intellect, with, with what goes on inside and what you feed this thing with. So there has to be some point where we're exercising our minds when it comes to the things of God. Um, and I'm just, this might hurt maybe for some, I think it's got to be more than six minutes devotional in the morning. I'm not sure that's enough to sustain the mind of Christ in you. Um, At some point, there has to be this growing Christian mind. And I, I just don't think that it's okay for you to be in church for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years and still be as doctrinally confused as you were when you first got converted. And God help us, that's happening all over the place. I can't tell you the number of people who have been in church for 20, 30, 40 years who will approach me in the hallway and say, I've never heard some of this stuff. And my thought is, either you weren't listening, or where the heck were you? It's why we study God's word as a center point of our church, both in our gathered times and in our scattered times in groups. God's word must be central. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, yes, with all your soul, yes, but with all of your mind, with your faculties, love him. With the totality of who you are, That's going deep. That's the great commandment. And I'll say it this way. There should be a ferocity with which you pursue those things. 
you should be furious towards those things, engaging them with everything that you have. That's going deep. But that's only half of the story because he doesn't stop there. So let's look at this. Verse 39, Jesus goes on. This is the great first commandment, verse 39. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, uh, Jesus quotes a second Old Testament commandment here. He already quoted Deuteronomy 6. Now he quotes Leviticus 19. In Leviticus 19, 18, it talks about loving neighbor as self, and he kind of usurps that and companions it with Deuteronomy 6, with the Shema, into what he calls the two aspects of loving God, the greatest commandment. Now, just because Jesus says this is the second one, it doesn't mean that it's subservient. It doesn't mean that it's like second place or something like that, because he says it is like the first one. The second is like the first one, meaning it too is great. The first one is great. The second one is like that. It's great as well, just like the first one. And in these two commandments, he says, you find the summation of all the law and prophets. So to the, to the, 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 the expert in the law's question of what is the greatest commandment, Jesus chooses two, combines them into one and says, everything hinges upon this. Love God and love others. Love God and love others. And that's Jesus' take for us. That's his thrust for the church. This is the great commandment. And so once again, the reason why everything that I think and pray for us hinges upon this is not just those two words, it's these two words. Reach wide. It's go deep and reach wide. Going deep is about loving God. Reaching wide is about loving people. You see how this works? See where this is coming from? The great commandment is the vision of our church. It's the vision of Fathom. And, and so you, you, if you've been in church for a minute, you've heard this before. You've heard the great commandment. You've probably heard sermons on this. And it's fascinating. The great commandment is covered in all three go, uh, synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all cover this. Uh, but Matthew and Mark stop right there. They stop right there. But Luke illustrates. And it's fascinating. Uh, he, he illustrates with a parable. So here's, we're going to do something that we don't normally do. I want you to flip in your Bibles away from Matthew 22 to the right to Luke chapter 10. Okay. Two books to the right, Matthew, Mark, Luke. You can flip there. This is not too challenging, but I want you to go to Luke chapter 10. If you get to John, you've gone too far. Okay. Luke chapter 10 is where Luke illustrates now the great commandment with a parable. And this is the second most famous parable in all of Jesus' teaching, okay? This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. He illustrates with the parable of the Good Samaritan. The most famous parable that Jesus ever teaches is the parable of the prodigal son. The second is like that, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, here's the fascinating thing. The Good Samaritan parable only shows up in Luke's gospel, for, for the second most famous parable of Jesus' entire teaching ministry to only show up in one book of the New Testament is fascinating to me. Parable of uh, the, the prodigal son shows up in all three synoptic gospels. This one only shows up in one. So Mark chapter 10, uh, we're gonna look at this parable because it's a companion parable to the great commandment. And I think it's really important for us. So Luke chapter 10, we're gonna pick that up in verse 29. Luke 10, 29. But he, now that's the lawyer, the Pharisee lawyer, but he, um, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So, so let me explain what, what's going on there. Uh, this lawyer has the audacity to ask a follow-up question. This is an audacious question. And the only reason why he would ask this question uh, is because, first of all, he is a Pharisee. That means he is a rule keeper. 
Second, he is a lawyer, which just levels him up in terms of his understanding of the law. And third, those two things mean that he is very likely a moralist. Some will call him them legalists. I think a better term is moralists. And only a moralist would ask this type of question. Jesus, thank you for sharing with us the, the greatest commandments. But just real quick, and we, we read it in the text, desiring to justify himself, he follows up with this question, who's my neighbor? Only a moralist would ask that question. Only a moralist would try to ask that question because moralists often feel comfortable about their own lives because they think that their behavior and their beliefs justify them. Only a moralist would follow up with this question. It's, a, it's back to what we talked about last week. It, moralists, the Pharisees, they think that if I just believe the right thing and I just behave the right way, then I don't have to worry about anything else that's going on inside of me. I just believe and behave right and I'm justified. So seeking to justify himself means that this lawyer feels that his external actions are gonna be good enough. He never would have asked the question if he didn't think that. He never thought he would, he never would have asked this question if he thought that Jesus was going to answer the way that he answers. He thinks that Jesus is going to say to, who is my neighbor? He thinks Jesus is going to say, well, your family and your friends and your like your countrymen, other, other Israelites, other Jews, like they are your neighbors. And then this Pharisee of Pharisees, this lawyer of the Pharisees could say, I do all of those things. Yes, Jesus, I do all of those things. I, I, I love the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my mind. I do all of those things and I love my neighbor as myself. And then everybody could look at him and be like, dang, this guy is great. And they, and they really can't even question him. They really can't even question him on it because he's a Pharisee. He does those things better than everybody else. He does those things better than everybody else. But Jesus is is going to derail this whole scheme. Bro, it's like your baby was just born or something. <laughs> Emily, I know you can hear me in there. I love you. <laughs> so Jesus is about to derail the whole scheme of this guy, okay? So let's take a look at this. You'll know this passage. You know this parable, okay? But you might not know it as well as you think you do. So let's look at verse 30. To the question... Who is my neighbor? Jesus says this. He replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now stop. This is the parable set up. Jerusalem to Jericho and a man is walking down this road. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho is 18 miles long and it descends 3,300 feet vertically. So it is a downward road. You always go down from Jerusalem and you always go up to Jerusalem. This is a real road, a famous road, and it is downhill all the way. Uh, and so this is a parable, okay? This is not a real story. It's a story meant to illustrate, meant to awaken something in the reader into the hearer. So a man is on this road going down. And if you need, what you need to know is this is not a good road to go down on. It's not a safe road to be by yourself on because bandits and robbers liked to hide out in this road. And there were often nefarious business happening on this road. And it's going to happen in this story. So that's the setup verse. Or we'll continue in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers. So there's the shady business who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, I need you to know that no, we, we are given no other details about this man. We don't know anything about him. We know his gender. That's it. He's a guy. That's all we know. We don't know who he is. We don't know where he's, he falls on the socioeconomic class system, the pecking order. We don't know what his nationality is. We don't know re what religion he is. We know nothing about him. You can normally tell like where a person is from or, or what they believe even, especially in like um, the Middle East where, where everybody kind of looks, I mean, everybody kind of looks the same, but you normally can tell maybe who a person is and where they're from by, by two things, the way that they dress and then the way that they dialogue, like their dialect, like the, the, the way they inflect certain words or the accent that they have. But in this case, we are told that he is unconscious and he's naked. 
All I'm saying is the point of that, that, that those, those two qualifiers is to tell you that this is just a human male. It's a human being. This is anybody. We don't know anything about him. There's no prejudice thrown towards this guy. He is a human being in need of help. That's why that guy is naked and unconscious. He's a, he's a human being in need. Verse 31. Now, by chance, which by the way, it's never by chance, okay? Now by chance means this is totally planned, okay? Now by chance, a priest was going down from Jerusalem, uh, go, go, I'm sorry, going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the priest is the first one to pass him. Now the knee jerk reaction and almost every sermon that's ever been preached on this text is the priest is a jerk. That's the first react. The priest is a jerk. Like at some level, we would expect the clergy, like the priest to have some level of compassion towards this guy. And so I've heard a thousand sermons on this. You've probably heard a thousand sermons on this about this, but I just want to pose to you that it's much more complex than just what a jerk. Let me explain. Uh, let me set it up socially first, okay? Uh, the priest is the upper class of the Jews. He's an upper class, upper level socioeconomic man. And so he would not have been walking by. He very likely is riding by. He's of that ilk. He's of that level in their society. And so that means he definitely has the financial means to be able to help this guy. He's got, bro, bro's got the coin. He can't use that as an excuse. But then think about it religiously. This guy is a priest. He's a Jewish priest in the Hebrew priesthood. In that system, the priest was probably on his way back from serving in his two-week stint in the temple in Jerusalem. That's most likely why he's on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And here's what would happen. Uh, if that priest gets within four cubits of this guy, which is about six feet, if he gets within six feet of this guy, listen, to find out if he's even alive. Remember, he's naked, he's been beaten up, and he's unconscious. So we're not even sure if this guy's dead. He walks up on this body, and if he gets close enough to check and that body is indeed dead, he is ceremonially and ritualistically unclean. And that means something for the Jews. It means a lot for a priest in this system. He would have had then at that point to go back up to Jerusalem and begin what's known as the rites of purification. In the rites of purification, it would require him to purchase livestock, most likely a bull, and then he would have to slaughter that bull and burn it to ash. After that, there's a seven-day waiting period, and then he will have to stand at the eastern gate of Jerusalem with everyone else who has sinned against God and is looking for uh, forgiveness, and he would have to wait until another priest came by to admonish him and to make him clean. So this guy would be filled with personal guilt, personal shame, a whole bunch of money that he would have had to spend. Now, he had the money, but he would have had to spend that, but most most important here is that he, during that week plus time, would have been unable to take tithes and offerings and food, which is how he fed his family. The priests would eat the, the allotted portions for the priests and for their family. So he would be unable to care for his very family out of this predicament. So I'm just, I, I say all of those things to point out that this is not as simple cut and dry as what a jerk. We shouldn't trust priests. That's, that's not the point of this text. This is a very complicated situation and it's real easy to cast judgment, but I would just say, be careful by, with, without casting too harsh a judgment without thinking through all of the pieces in this. But he is set up as somebody who overlooks a man in need. It's a complicated situation. Indeed, but he overlooks the man. He passes on the other side. He gives himself the four cubits so that he doesn't have to even risk becoming ceremonially unclean. And I think the point is this. We can become so distracted doing important things, like real important things, 
that we miss out on the most important things. Like, listen, the priest is only doing what God has commanded him to do. And yet he misses the man who needs him. This is hard. This means you can read your Bible and miss the most important thing. This means you can come to church and miss the most important thing. Jesus will go on later in Matthew's gospel and say, hey, you can tithe like crazy. Like you can, you can tithe your mint and your dill. You can tithe your spice rack. You can get a bo- box of salt at King Supers, cut 10% of that grain, grain by grain and tithe that so that that's how crazy legalistic you are in your tithing. And yet you can miss the weightier matters of the law. Remember that light versus heavy? What's the greatest law? You can miss the weightier commandments. We can become so distracted by doing important things that we miss the most important thing. That's what the first guy does. He's distracted by his religious duties. But then another guy shows up. Remember, this is a story. This isn't a real thing. This is a story. Look at verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So so you need to know something about Levites here for a second. Um, Priests and Levites are different, okay? Uh, All priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. That makes sense? Uh, All priests must come from the tribe of Levi. That's a Levite. So one of the 12 tribes, they must all come from that tribe. But only within one household of the Levitical tribe do we get the line of priests, and that's Aaron's house. So Aaron is a Levite, and only his descendants get to be priests. Everybody else in the tribe of Levi can be Levites. Okay, so that's what we're talking about there. So think of the Levites, like they would assist the the priests. It's like... um, it's like the JV quarterback who sits on the bench and ain't ever, he's never going to play, right? He's got no business throwing that football, but he's kind of like, he's the JV quarterback. He's never making varsity. Does that make sense? Uh, if you're not a sports person, uh, he is the assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> That's a Levite, okay? The Levite is Dwight Schrute. That's who the Levites are in this world. Now that we're with me, now that you're following me here, okay? Uh, this is what we need to know about the Levite. He's making nowhere near as much money as the priest. So he is financially, this would be a difficult thing for him to do. This Levi absolutely is walking down the road. He's not riding some animal down the road, okay? Uh, and, and, and here's my thought. Now, I'm not sure about this. This is a story. This is a parable. So I'm gonna read into it a little bit. You can deal with that how you want to. But, but the thing about a road that is 17 miles going all the way down is that there are sections where you can then see ahead probably pretty far down the road. Maybe two, three miles down the road you might be able to see because it's all steady downhill. And so here's my guess. It's a story, it's a parable, so we can, we can play with it a little bit. But my guess is that the Levite who, who serves this priest maybe has just been working with this priest up at the temple in Jerusalem who doesn't have as much money as the priest and who's all by himself. He doesn't have the same means or clout as this priest and is also, hear me, bound by the exact same ritualistic cleansing laws as this priest, maybe just saw the priest take a wide berth around this little hump of a man right here on the road and thinks to himself, well, if the priest didn't do anything about it, If my boss didn't do anything about this, then there is no chance that I'm going to touch that guy. I most certainly am not going to do it. Besides, uh, even if I did help him, I don't have the money. Like, I don't have the means. I'm not at the same level. I don't roll like he does. I don't have that much scratch in my pocket. I can't take care of this guy. I've got to take care of my own family. If he didn't do anything, I'm certainly not going to do anything. And so, too, the Levite passed by. He passed by. I'll make a point here, second point. While, while the priest was distracted by his religious things, uh, my hunch is that the Levi is becoming defensive. I think he's making excuses 
based on what he's seeing somebody above his means do, based on how he assesses his own financial situation and his own abilities. I think he's making, and hear me, legitimate excuses, but I think he's defending. I think he's being defensive in this moment with these excuses. And he too is gonna miss out the most important thing, a person in need. But then the third person that shows up is what makes this parable shocking. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had, what's the word? Compassion. This is what makes the story scandalous. Those words, but a Samaritan. The Samaritan is what makes this story scandalous because because when you consider what Jews thought of Samaritans and who Jesus is speaking to, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders in the temple of God, and the hero of this story turns out to be a Samaritan, they would have been floored. They, were, they would have been, I mean, Jews despised the Samaritans. It's hard for me to even explain to you how much hate was built up in their hearts towards this people group. We have a recording from Josephus, the Jewish scholar from the first century, that says that Jewish men would often pray prayer something like this. God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile. I thank you that I'm not a woman. Sorry, gals, that's just part of the culture. But then they would say, I thank you that I am not a Samaritan, do not answer their prayers. They would pray to God, asking God not to answer the prayers of the Samaritans. Do you know how much hate you have to have in your heart to be praying to God and to say, God, I want forgiveness. I want forgiveness for everybody except for that guy. Like in your prayers, that's what's happening there. So, you, so, so the question is, why do the Samaritans, why are they so hated? Well, it's centuries of history. I don't have time to go into all of it, but I'll keep it brief because I think it's helpful. In the year 722 BC, so 700 plus years before Jesus is telling this story, uh, Israel was attacked by a, an empire called Assyria. The Assyrian Empire attacked Israel. The, the, uh, there's 12 tribes of Israel. The top 10 tribes are called Israel. The bottom 10 tribes are called Judah. Israel is attacked by Assyria, and the Assyrians take the top 10 tribes, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they deport, the Assyrians deport all of the Israelites of substance into exile. So, so leaders, cultural elites, and the like, all of the really important Israelites are, are exported, are deported into other parts of the Assyrian Empire, and they leave a remnant of just kind of the poor and the weak and the marginal in Israel, and then they repopulate with other peoples from the Assyrian Empire so that then they can actually repopulate uh, this city, this country. Uh, and if, if it's, I mean, it's a brilliant strategy, actually. It's a brilliant strategy. If you, unless you want to murder everyone and then have nobody to actually take care of the land that you are conquering, it's a brilliant strategy to try to water down and essentially erase cultural identity and cultural distinctives by intermarrying peoples from different groups. That's exactly what they are trying to do. And, and, and that remnant are known as the Samaritans because the city that they were in is a city called Samaria. So this is where the Samaritans, as a people group, as we're talking about, are from. And during the next couple, well, uh, Babylon shows up a couple years later and wrecks shop on Judah. So we're talking 70 plus years before the, the Jews are brought back into the promised land. So for the next couple of generations, there's intermarrying between Assyrian and Babylonian peoples and the remnant of Israel that are left in Israel and Judah. And they are marrying and they're having babies. And for a couple of generations, it's like they, they begin to syncretize their lives with these foreigners and they begin to syncretize their religion with these foreign idols and, and worship. And so all of a sudden you have a new people group that when the Jews return after the exile, they hate them. They see them as half breed 
and they see them as polluted in terms of their religion. That's what's happening here. And then, follow with me, six and a half centuries of that hatred marinates. This is why, by the way, when in John chapter four, when Jesus is at a well and a Samaritan woman comes to him and his, his followers are aghast, why are you talking with her? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Hundreds of years later, this is their viewpoint of the Samaritans. So for Jesus then to use uh, a Samaritan to out compassion a priest and a Levite, the religious elite in the Hebrew nation was scandalous. I, we have, no, we have no, nothing that we could compare this to, the kind of cultural hate that resides there. Now, here's what I also want you to know. The Samaritan is not a Gentile. He's not a non-believer in God, in Yahweh. He's just kind of got some other stuff thrown in there. So, so that means that the Samaritan is bound by the same ritualistic laws as the Levi and the priest, a Levite and the priest, uh, meaning that if this guy is indeed dead or unclean, he, the Samaritan, is going to have to do the same ritualistic purifications. Maybe not to the same level as the priest, but he's still going to be considered unclean and is going to have to deal with that. So this is not an irreligious person. It's just a different side of things. And the text says that the Samaritan is moved with compassion. He's not distracted by his religious stuff. He's not making all kinds of excuses and, 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 you know, and just kind of moving away from that guy. He, he, it says he's moved with compassion. Now, you know the rest of the story, but uh, let's, we may as well just finish it up. Uh, verse 34. The Samaritan went to him, bound up his wounds, poured on oil and wine, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. There, I mean, there's a ton of cultural things that we can go into there. I don't have time for, but real quick, the Samaritan gets off of his animal, shows compassion to this man. And in, that, in doing so, he has put himself in the same position as that man. If there's bandits that are watching what's going on, he could be attacked himself. He's not trying to hide his identity. He indeed throws the man on his animal. He pours some oil and wine on the guy and takes him to an inn. He, he's not hiding his face. He's not hiding his identity. He, he, he bandages the man's wounds. He spends the night there caring for him. He pays money to the innkeeper because if this guy wakes up after this guy's gone and he doesn't pay, he will be put in jail immediately. And so he's like, here, take two denarii, take care of him. If, if it costs more, I'm good for it. You know me. I'm not hiding from you. Like he's doing all that he possibly can to show compassion and care for that man. He lets himself be seen. He lets himself be known. And he assumes all the risk on himself. No distractions, no defensiveness, pure compassion. And then verse 36, <laughs> I love this. This is Jesus now back to that lawyer. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? So that's the question. Remember the, the question was, who is my neighbor? Seeking to justify himself, he asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus says, which of those three proved to be a neighbor to this man? And now, how easy would it have been for the guy to say, the Samaritan? But he doesn't. Verse 37, the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. I mean, I could almost hear the tension. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. But he couldn't not say it. So he says, the one who showed him mercy, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Guys, that's the, the great commandment. It's the great commandment. I love that Luke adds that, that parable in there. I think it helps illustrate it a bit, but, but this is the great commandment. 
This is a big, big deal doctrinally for us. This is go deep, reach wide. This is why I'm talking about this today. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's, that's this progressive, ongoing pressing into Jesus Christ with a ferocity of your relationship to him. It's, it's a seriousness with, about your walk with him. That's love the Lord your God with everything that you have. Uh, listen to me. Jesus is a really, really terrible hobby. If this is a hobby to you, you've made a wrong choice. Go running. Go trail running. Go, go for a mountain bike ride. The music here, pretty good. Red Rocks is better. Probably get it for cheaper than a tithe. Go to concerts. If this is a hobby for you, listen, it makes a terrible hobby. Jesus is not a good hobby. Jesus is not a good side hustle. If he's not your main thing, this is a really bad investment of your time and your energy. And, and the Bible won't let you believe that he can be a side hustle or a hobby. He's your pursuit. He's your main thing. We say go deep, and that's what I hope, and that's what I pray for us. That's why we've been talking about this for almost a decade together. This is about going deep. It's loving the Lord your God with all that you are. But then the second is like it. And that's reach wide. That's, that's love neighbor. That's love someone else. And we might have that same inclination. Well, well Jesus, seeking to justify myself, who's my neighbor? because I'm really nice to Tim who lives next door. And you know, man, Ellen, three doors down, she's kind of irritating and she's got cats. And so I'm not sure I can love her as much. No. So who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Anyone. Anyone. Anyone in need of compassion. This is why this guy is not identified. He's not poor, he's not rich. He's not Jew, he's not Gentile. We're not sure anything about him other than he is naked, unconscious, in need of help. Who's our neighbor? Anybody. Anybody in need of compassion, and Jesus says, go and do likewise. Who's my neighbor? Anyway, you go do that. You want to be justified? You go do that. You go do that. So yes, that's people in actual physical need. I don't want to miss that. Like that, that means that we, we, we feed the hungry and we clothe the naked and we care for the homeless and we work with the poor and we, we, we help break chains of the addicted. Like we do those things. People with real felt needs, we actually meet them where they are and help them with that. But this is also those who are in spiritual need. Just because we're in the burbs doesn't mean we're off the hook on these things. This means your, your coworkers and your neighbors and your family members and your friends, everyone in your sphere of influence who needs mercy and compassion that Jesus offers is your neighbor and you're called to give it to them. But we're often distracted, man. We're defensive. I, I mean, I just, I'm more like the priest than I want to admit. Like I'm... <laughs> I'm just more like that and get real busy doing my Christian stuff. I got D group. I don't have time for that. I think if we're honest, we, most of us would say we're failing on probably one side or the other more. Like I would imagine if there's like a scale of go deep, reach wide, of love God and love people, I think we're probably not a lot of us perfectly balanced. We probably err to one side or another depending on like our affinities and our presuppositions and our experiences and all that. So, so some of you are probably like heavier go deep people. Just by nature, like you want to talk theology. You love it. You love reading the Bible. You want to talk theology. Like you want to clean up your moral acts. You're disciplined. You like doing spiritual disciplines. You're very good at like Bible reading and prayer and all these things. And, and, and listen, like you probably read like Wayne Grudem's systematic theology to your kids before bed. Like, I mean, just like, reading that stuff. Don't judge us, okay? Like, that's good stuff. But, but, but if you're there, man, very often that theology becomes like a manual that you never intend to use. 
that, that go deep, that personal depth, that head stuff, if you never put it into action, what is it for? And then some of you are more reach wide. You're just kind of more bent towards that missional side, like let's engage the poor, let's engage the needy, let's go on mission, let's like get our hands dirty. But I'm just telling you, Jesus combines the two. He puts them together. He says, you cannot do one without the other because if you do one without the other, it goes wrong. It mutates. It, it gets off. It becomes moralism over here, right? And it becomes this like idealistic servitude over here that is devoid of the power of the thing that really matters. All, both by themselves are wrong. And Jesus says, you need to be furious about both. There needs to be a ferocity towards heart and hands, towards love God and towards love others, towards go deep and towards reach wide. They're the two sides of the same coin of what it means to fulfill the great commandment. And I'm just telling you, it's gonna take time for us to do this. So I wanna do this with you for 30 years because it's gonna take time. It's not gonna happen overnight. This is what we're trying to do. This is why we're moving buildings. This is why we do what we do here at Fathom. This is what we're fighting for. This is the angst that is in me as your pastor. That's what I'm wanting to give my life for. That's what I want you to join me in giving your life for. Love God, love God. Others go deep, reach wide. I went long, let's pray. Lord, we bless you. We, we praise you, Father, for the goodness that you extend to us in giving us really, really clear instructions here from your mouth that the most important things, the greatest things is loving you and loving people. We confess, Lord, that we are falling short on this all over the place. And so, Holy Spirit, would you work in us? Would you call us to a deeper place? Would you help us to be bold and to reach to wider places? And may your kingdom flourish because of the faithfulness of your saints. Holy Spirit, we need your power to actually make these things happen. So, so give us what we need every day as we put on our shoes, as we, as we go about our business. Help us, Lord, to go deep and to reach wide. We love you, Father. We pray these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. Amen.